Does everyone, everyone have less than 10? Less than 10 for today. The Holy Spirit. Everybody else that? Gave them out last week, so if you were here last week, you should have the, the last four. I'm going to write a few things on the board today, and I'm, uh, <laughs> this is so broad, uh, even just limiting the Holy Spirit to Luke and Acts, is still uh, 36 plus 55 scriptures. That's just two books. So now, there's probably the books that say the most about the Holy Spirit, at least certainly Acts. Uh, some suggest that we should call the book of Acts, Acts of the Holy Spirit. So, it's where, as we'll see, God pointed to this time from all the times of old and the prophets have been saying it for centuries and so on. I want to do a quick look at Luke because it, it does say some things and set the stage and then we'll look at who seems to be the center of attention when the Holy Spirit is mentioned and you'll see that that's you know, more than the apostles, okay? That's, number one, that's something. Because we think of the apostles as being uh, really the only ones affected by the Holy Spirit, which is kind of silly when you think about it because we're all supposed to have the gift of the Holy Spirit. So why would it center only in the apostles? What I want to write on the board as we get there is the, the verb that talks about the Spirit. Um... There's something to be learned. I'm not sure it is quite as uh, definitive. Uh, and I think that's probably a conclusion I've reached this week. I've, I've given a lot of credit to words like baptize and fall and fill. Um, but when you look at these passages, those words tend to kind of melt together a bit. And I'll look at uh, the principle of that with you, as at least I'm understanding it today. It's interesting that in uh, in Luke chapter one, we have multiple references in Luke chapter one, two, and three, and that's the birth experience of Jesus the temple experience of his parents and Jesus, the end of chapter 1, and, or 2, I should say, in the middle of chapter 2, and then Jesus' early ministry at his baptism. This is basically the only mention, uh, though there is connection with John. So basically, Luke, from chapter 3, uh, you know, later, there's, there's not as much said. That word is not used throughout the ministry of Jesus. Uh, it is, but, it, but it's not, look, I mean, seven times in the first three chapters is a lot. And then not as much throughout. So that gives us a little bit of an idea. Luke 1.15 is, is uh, re referencing John. And the angel says, by the way, the first two are what the angel said. Okay, so that's how we know that. John will be filled with the Holy Spirit from his birth. Um, verse 17 goes on to say, he, uh, he will come in the Spirit and power of Elijah. Spirit is little s, but it, you know, where, where did Elijah get his spirit? You know, that, so I, I think that's a little bit telling. Mary also was told by the angel, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. Overshadow you. I think there are some gentle references to how people have children in that. This is not going to be your husband. Okay, God is going to bring this child into the world through you. Uh, Elizabeth. Now, this is not an angel talking. Mary comes into the room. Elizabeth says, Whoo! He leaped in my womb when you entered and spoke. And it references that 
he was filled with the Holy Spirit at that moment. This is not an insignificant verse in the abortion debate, folks. Now, we have a lot of references in Scripture to things happening before, before uh, not conception, before birth, okay? And this is, this is one of the strongest of there being a, a spiritual, mental, physical, that's all together. He leaped in the womb. He reacted to the voice of the mother of his Lord. And uh, he, we're told he was filled with the Holy Spirit. So that's, that's in every way John is being dealt with as, as a preborn child. So it is what it is. Then Zacharias is filled with the Spirit when he gets his voice back and he begins to prophesy. And that's not unusual as we go through the rest of Acts. You see the Spirit come and you see someone start talking about you know, either using God's Word or referencing God's Word to talk about what's happening in the world around them. Like Agabus talking about the famines, for instance. All right, Simeon, verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 25 and following, the Holy Spirit was upon him. He is righteous and devout and looking. I'm getting behind a little here. It just... When you're talking about a spiritual reality, any reference, any description of that just tries to fill in a little bit of the blanks about what does that mean. And, and it's, a difficult, it's a difficult thing to do. Jesus says, or John says, Jesus will baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Now it's significant, I think, that John is the one talking about this because what has John come doing? He's baptizing in water. And of course, that's the promise. I'm going to baptize you in water. The one coming after me will baptize you in the Holy Spirit and fire. And then you start seeing, these are spiritual references. What's a baptism in fire? Did you ever see fire consume someone? No. But when the Holy Spirit consumes someone, then... The Holy Spirit is, is like a fire. And so again, it's a spiritual reality being described in, uh, with a human example. And the human example is not literal. John didn't burn up. <laughs> Jesus didn't burn up. You know, that's not, it wasn't literal fire. It was a description of what goes through a person who is, is uh, filled with or the Spirit comes upon or whatever. And, of course, the Spirit descends like a dove at Jesus' baptism. That's probably the first time we, except for the phrase, you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. That's the first connection of the Holy Spirit at a baptism, is Jesus. And it's like a uh, blessing into ministry. Okay, you've, you've fulfilled God's will. Jesus said John's baptism was God's will for them. And the Pharisees didn't do it. But those who did went into God's will. They wanted, they wanted to do whatever God wanted them to do. John said do it. They did it. John said he was from God. They obeyed. Let's read uh, Luke 4, 14 and 18. So at, this is after the, tempta after the baptism and temptation. Verse 14 says, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. And news about him spread throughout the surrounding district. Once I leave the actual words that are used, I'm taking a step into interpretation. Do you understand what I mean by that? When, when we don't understand something, the best words to use are the words God used. When you still don't understand it, that's not God's fault. <laughs> okay? 
That means it's really deep, you know. So what we start doing is we start rearranging the words and try to make it more understandable, but we take steps away from the actual wording. This is why translation is problematic. You need to be consistent when you go through Scripture and you tell people what these words mean so that they can compare baptism here with baptism here. But if you call it baptism here and you call it immersion here and you call it sprinkling there, and then nobody knows what baptism is anymore. So, you know, I'm going to say in the power of the Spirit is like under the Spirit's power. And you'd say, well, that sounds pretty much the same thing. Okay, it does, but remember, I took a step away when I did that. Just, it's just important that we be as honest as we can with the text and, and let it speak for itself. He was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted, we were told. Um, where was that? Verse 1. He was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, tempted by the devil, Luke has said. Verse 18, he goes to the synagogue and opens the passage that says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, set free those who are oppressed, and proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Proclaim the year's jubilee if you want. Use it that way, that's the Old Testament way of talking about that favorable year. Okay? So... Holy Spirit is in prophecy. Jesus goes to prophecy, reads it in the synagogue, said, this is me, this is fulfilled today in your hearing. He connects himself with the prophecy and, he, and the prophecy is about the Holy Spirit and the prophecy refers to him. Now you get other instances, and I wrote the number 12, if you, if you want to take my word for it. There's 12 other instances where spirit refers to an evil spirit or an unclean spirit. Uh, there are six times in Acts where that occurs. Um, the only other use of the word spirit in Luke is when a dead person's spirit returned to them. So no, you're not guessing and dreaming when, when someone dies and you say, wow, their spirit left them. Well, that, you know, Jesus talked about that at his death. This was talked about in Luke 8. Uh, 55, that's a way of talking about things. We have a spirit, God has a spirit. God is spirit. God is a spirit and He has a spirit. Now we're getting muddy. Which is it? Yes, it's both. It's, it's, it's so hard to make language wrap around something as big as God and, and explain Him. So we get two promises in Luke 10, and, and honestly when I wrote that down, I thought, why did I call that a promise? He rejoiced in the spirit Jesus rejoiced that God revealed everything to common people. He called them babes instead of the rich and powerful only. And 11.13, uh, the Father gives the Spirit to those who ask Him. I think that's a... Um, I'm going to put give... Because that's the first thing we're going to look at in Acts. Well, just about. Except I'm going to do this topically, so it's not. <laughs> All right, let's look at Jesus. Acts chapter 1, verse 2. The phrase here is, is what I got out of that verse. Jesus gave orders to the apostles by the Holy Spirit. He told his hearers in Nazareth, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. You're supposed to get out of that, that Jesus has uh, God's Spirit. He is filled with God's Spirit. The Spirit has come upon him. It literally, physically came from heaven and lighted on his shoulder in the form of a dove. That was a physical manifestation using a dove. But he is still operating after his resurrection, before his ascension, under the... Guidance, the leadership, the leading of the Holy Spirit, and His directions come from what God wants to be said at that moment in time. I'll suggest to you that it's not different for us. 
what, to whatever extent you want to think about having the Holy Spirit in you and you speaking God's Word, and therefore God's will, then, then we are allowing ourselves to be led by God because the Spirit is the author of the Bible and of God's words. And so it's not di- we don't do something different than what Jesus did here. You might look and say, well, I'm not Jesus. Well, that's true in a lot of ways and degrees and every other way. But it doesn't mean we don't get to participate in this. Okay? We don't have to say, Jesus has the Holy Spirit, I don't. That's, that's in error. That's not correct. Yes, Doyle? <laughs> well, that's our lesson today. So let's let's uh, let me put that off just a little bit. Let me lay the foundation in Jesus and the apostles, and then on the back of the page, we're going to talk about what about what about everyone else, you know? Because that's the answer to your question. Uh, I will I will repeat and and join you in saying I always thought that when I was baptized, I received the Holy Spirit. But here we're seeing things like ask for it and it fell without my awareness or knowledge or pre... I wasn't expecting it, these people would would say. Uh, And and so that's beginning to turn my head a little bit to say, why is it that I want to put God's gift in one box with one method, with one everything, and everybody has to get it exactly the same way and in the same timing? That, that isn't what happens in Acts, okay? I just have to admit to you, it's not what happens. Everyone gets it in a different schedule than what we think. Um, I'll, I'll skip with Jesus to Acts 10. This is Cornelius. And it's just that Jesus was anointed by God with the Holy Spirit and went about doing good. That's Peter's description of Jesus' life. So you have Luke saying he stood up and read, you know, the Spirit is upon me. You've got the Spirit descending at his baptism. You've got him giving orders by the Holy Spirit right before his ascension. And then Peter preaching well into the Christian movement. When When we think back about Jesus' life on the earth, you could say he was anointed by God with the Holy Spirit. That's a good way of describing who Jesus is and how he functioned in the world. Well, that does seem rather summary you know, good, a good way of thinking about Jesus. Um, let me just say, I started with Jesus because it appears to be the center of the preaching, as we've talked about the last few weeks. Paul and Peter and, and Apollos and Aquila and Priscilla and Stephen, everyone wants to establish the Spirit was upon Jesus He is the anointed one. This is a word for Messiah. It's the meaning of the Greek word Messiah. So when we talk about the Holy Spirit and Jesus, it's it's like that's who he is. He's the Christ. Messiah, is that Greek or Hebrew? (laughs) Hebrew, thank you. All of a sudden that didn't sound right. Christ is Greek, Messiah is Hebrew. Thanks. All right. Then Scripture is talked about, and this is the way Scripture is talked about with reference to the Holy Spirit. I think it's Peter that says in Acts 1.16, the Holy Spirit foretold Judas' betrayal. How did the Holy Spirit foretell that? Well, he quotes a Scripture from the Old Testament. And then in Acts 4.25, in front of the uh, Sanhedrin in this case, Peter says, the Holy Spirit, through the mouth of our father David, said... It's very common in Scripture to have the Holy Spirit said. Hebrews says, well, I just messed it up. Hebrews uses the words, the Holy Spirit says. Because the Word of God is eternal, there is no timing on that. You know, it's just uh, the, the, the faith of these writers is fascinating as accurately describing something that, that the Word of God is forever. And then in 28, the Holy Spirit rightly spoke through Isaiah the prophet that you, you might be those that have hard hearts. And Isaiah prophesied that, but it was the Holy Spirit who rightly spoke. Okay? So in, in Acts, and I think this is a picture of Luke as well, 
the people who heard the Scriptures being read either, well, maybe I can't say that about Luke. I think it's described that way in Luke as well. But during the time of the church, when the Holy Spirit is, is all around and people are doing things like the apostles speaking in tongues that they've never studied, and I'm hearing this in my own tongue, but I know he's from Galilee and he doesn't know where I come from. So when you start hearing the Holy Spirit being referred to all around you, then, then the writers begin to say, well, it was the Holy Spirit who said this in the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit was doing this in the Old Testament. And to go to our... Uh, sermon text today, the Spirit of God moved across the face of the waters at creation. So, God is doing things with the Holy Spirit, and there might be times when men are unaware of what's being done. But Scripture goes back and, and kind of fills in the gaps for us and tells us this is really what was happening. You just, you know, you just didn't think of it that way, or you didn't talk about it that way. You, Doyle? Right. Yeah. Yeah, the the average person today who's uneducated, I don't know how else to say it, about the Bible and how it came to be and what it is, looks at it and says, well, people wrote that. But people who've studied it, and they ask the question you just asked, how is it that these people knew something that was going to happen 1,500 years later? Moses, for instance. How does... How does this Isaiah know that in 15 years this is going to happen in this person's life and he names them? How, does that, how is that possible? That's beyond just a human being's knowledge. And so that's why we began to look at the Bible and say there's something different in these words. And one way of describing that is it is the presence of the Holy Spirit. It's his words that are, that are doing the talking. Now the apostles are clearly... Uh, our focus in my studies in Acts, we, we tend to focus at the apostles. <clears throat> when you look at this list, chapter 1, 2, 4, 9, 10, 13, 15, and 16, and that's it. Um, that's not a very big slice out of the whole 28 chapters of Acts. So uh, let's look at what kind of things the apostles do. Uh, Acts 1 uh, Jesus promises that John baptized with water, but you will be filled with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So there's our filled. Yeah. Um, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. What's that power? I mean... This come upon thing is being talked about. Well, what does it mean? Well, it's partly related to power. Um, Acts 2 verse 4, they began to speak with tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance or the ability to speak. So, this is maybe an action... And I'm going to write the word language here. Because people standing around said, hey, that's my language. So it wasn't gibberish. Not in Acts 2. We'll make a note of that in the others. Peter's standing before the Sanhedrin, and, and the text says, uh, 4 verse 8, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said... Someone who is filled tends to speak. <laughs> How do I know he's filled with the Holy Spirit? Well, did you hear what came out of his mouth? I mean, he stood up. Okay, this is the same group that crucified Jesus. The same trial room. Jesus stands there saying absolutely nothing. Will not grace them with an answer, frankly. I'm just, that's my interpretation of that. He finally speaks to Pilate. But he didn't really talk much to the Sanhedrin. 
Peter gets in there and he just starts in. Ooh. And it says they looked at him and they said, these guys aren't educated. And I mean, this is kind of unusual. He's acting like this in front of us. Well, the, Luke says he was filled with the Holy Spirit. That's why he spoke as the Spirit gave him utterance. Ananias in 9.17 says, Paul will be filled with the Holy Spirit. And what does Paul do? He goes out in the streets and he begins to preach Jesus is the Christ. How did he know that? Because Jesus appeared to him and the Holy Spirit filled him. And so he goes out with the same message of everybody else. In Acts 10.19, Peter was directed by the Spirit to let the messengers of Cornelius in. It's kind of, you know, and everything about that story fits. The messengers are outside at the gate. They're saying, hey, is Peter in there? Why did they do that? What Peter said in a little bit is, you know we're not supposed to be in the same room together. Yeah, they knew. They stood out at the gate and hollered at him. But he invites them in. He says, the Holy Spirit's told me I don't need to look at you the way I used to look at you and the way everyone else is right now. So I'm going to do this differently. And that's attributed to the Holy Spirit. Paul was filled with the Holy Spirit when he stopped this man who was called Son of Jesus, who was interfering with Sergius Paulus, who was a proconsul. He blinded this man the same way he had been blinded when he was in error, interestingly. But the Spirit seems to give him the power to do that. And the guy quits interfering, and the Sergius Paulus is baptized. In the letter to the Gentiles, Acts 15, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. Ooh. I'm going to use the word seem. Now we're into territory that we're familiar with. That is, being unfamiliar. <laughs> How did they know that it seemed good to the Holy Spirit? Because the Holy Spirit said, that sounds pretty good. Do it. Is that what it was? No, in Acts 15, what was going on? Peter says, well, no, wait a minute. It was my mouth that told Cornelius the gospel, and that fits this scripture. And James gets up and he says, well, this scripture says this. And then when they get through, they say, well, you know what? It seems to the Holy Spirit, and it seems to us. Now that we listen to what the Holy Spirit has been saying all of, all of our lives and everybody else's lives since the beginning of time, I, we don't have to make this so much more mysterious than it already is. It is already plenty mysterious. But when you see... The, the context of what happened when that kind of language gets used, you see that what they're relying on is the Word of God. Well, if you and I can't do the same thing and give God credit saying, well, it seems like what the Holy Spirit is saying, that's just a recognition that, God, that the Spirit is who writes the Bible. You can stand on good ground with that. That's probably a better way of saying it instead of, well, in my opinion. Well, it's not your opinion, it's His opinion. He wrote this, those words. And then the last one that I'll, and then I'll read this paragraph with you. Well, it's, this is the whole subject. The, the Holy Spirit guides Paul's travel, and here's what you get. In 16.6, he forbid them. We were forbidden by the Spirit, it says. But in 19, it says that Paul purposed in spirit to go to Jerusalem, 19.21. In 2022, it says they were bound, or, or he was bound by the Spirit. And the Spirit warned that bonds and afflictions, the next verse, 2023, bonds and afflictions await. We're still talking about Jerusalem. In 21, in verse 4 and in verse 11, the brethren are saying, through the Spirit, don't go to Jerusalem. Now, are you confused? Because I'm real confused. Because Paul purposed in the Spirit to go to Jerusalem, but the Spirit is telling the brethren, or the Spirit told them the same thing, and their conclusion was, don't go to Jerusalem. 
Hmm. And it says, they, were, uh, they told him by the Spirit not to set foot in Jerusalem, but he purposed in spirit to go to Jerusalem. And here's the kicker for me. At the end of the whole discussion, they said, okay, if you want to go to Jerusalem, that's fine. The will of the Lord be done. Here they are wrestling with what they know. And if you've seen Paul's career up to verse or chapter 19 and 20 and 21, well, just like it says, everywhere I go, bonds, as in chains, <laughs> chains and ropes and things await me. This is going to happen wherever I go. Is it going to be different in Jerusalem? Yeah, it'll probably be worse. And the brethren say, oh, don't go, don't go. And Agabus the prophet says, this is what God says, and he wraps Paul's hands up in, in his belt, and he says, the man that owns this belt is going to go to Jerusalem, and the Jews are going to turn him over to the Gentiles. Now that is correct. But what they thought was going to happen, if I could presume, is that Paul was going to go to Jerusalem like Jesus did, and the Jews were going to turn Paul over to the Romans, and he was going to be crucified. That's the way that sounds when that's what you've been through. But what actually happened? We've read this. Paul went to Jerusalem. It was the Jews that tried to kill him. It was the Romans who saved him. And so, yeah, he was handed over to the Gentiles. That's, that's a threat when they say it. It was the salvation in God's mind. This is our problem with understanding the Spirit and prophecy. That's why there's a gift of discernment. You can't just waltz in here and understand everything God is saying and doing. Because that one little set of instances right there tells me it is a whole lot more complicated than we think. And we, we probably should be tentative when we start talking about what the Holy Spirit is doing or what the outcome is supposed to be based on what the Holy Spirit's doing. That's right. And, uh, and God appears to him, I can't remember if it's an angel, if it's uh, the Spirit or what, but you know, he is assured that he's spoken in Jerusalem, he's going to go to Rome. And that turns out, that's, the God, that's God's will. And he gets that directly. Well, let me show you uh, two things. I'm going to have to speed up here a little bit to get through this. The Spirit is a Spirit of promise. These verses really talk about this. The Acts 2 is about the Joel prophecies, uh, the Psalms. It's identified as the promise from Abraham that all of this happened throughout all the preaching of, of uh, Acts. Um, I said gives, uh, that's Acts 2.38. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Tuck that in back a little bit. It's a gift. When does the reception happen? Acts 5, the Holy Spirit is given to those who obey Him. That's a promise. That you obey and this is what's going to happen. Same, same for you. And in Acts 11, uh, Peter talking to the... Uh, Jews in Jerusalem, the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem, reminded them of John baptizing with water and that they, that they were told they would be baptized with the Holy Spirit. That was a promise. And it happened. And he reminded them that. And he said, now, it's the Gentiles' turn, which we'll talk to uh, at length next week. Now, notice all these verses that speak of the church. The place was shaken and they began to speak with boldness. You thought it was going to say, and they began to speak in tongues. No? They just began to speak with boldness, the confidence factor. Ananias and Sapphira lie to the Holy Spirit and test the Holy Spirit. Those are G uh, Peter's words as he speaks to Ananias and then to Sapphira. And, and they lose their lives because they lie and they test the Holy Spirit. Big, big deal in the early church and now. We're going to choose seven. They have to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. How do you know? 
I don't know, I'm kind of looking at him. He kind of looks full of the Spirit. Is that all? See, I'm thinking, I'm thinking the, the speaking and the boldness and, and the, the words of God flowing through a vessel like ours are evidences that we are full of God's Spirit and His wisdom, interestingly enough. So, boldness and wisdom. kind of filling out the picture of what it means to have the Holy Spirit. Uh, they were unable to cope with the spirit of Stephen, and so they hauled him into the Sanhedrin. The spirit spoke to Philip and snatched him away at the end of the chapter when he's talking to the Ethiopian. Uh, Acts 9, the peace, the comfort of the Holy Spirit, I think it's the peace of God, the comfort of the Holy Spirit, continued to increase... That was after Saul was baptized. Yeah, they had peace because he wasn't going around arresting and dragging people around. Barnabas was good. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. And I'm, I'm not going to be able to write and talk here, but you can see all these have words that I'm not even getting on the, on the board. All these have additional elements. Agus predicted the famine by the Spirit. The Antioch church were sitting around praying and fasting, and the Holy Spirit said, send Barnabas and Saul on this journey. And they did, and it says, we did that, having been sent by the church. Hmm. Well, did the Spirit send or did the church send? Yes, they did. The disciples were continually filled with joy in the Holy Spirit. Now are you beginning to see some things here? What is the fruit of the Spirit? Oh, that's what that's talking about. All this stuff that happens when the Spirit is present, and that's how you know the Spirit is in this person. They have the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 6, 5. Uh, the last one, the Holy Spirit made you overseers. I talked about that a couple of weeks ago. Uh, elders, according to Paul in Acts 20, as he's talking to elders, he has... Uh, chosen. He said, you know, he didn't say, now I, I appointed you as elders and you better do what I said. No, he said the Holy Spirit made you overseers, you better do what he says. Whole different, whole different thing. All right, I have five minutes, I'm going to spend it on laying on of hands. We've read these passages. Here's, here's what I am seeing and, and uh, noticing. In Acts chapter 8, verses 14 through 21, we're dealing with Samaritans. Stephen is killed. Christians are scattered. They make their way into Samaria. It's Philip that's in Samaria. He preaches. And it says, when they believed Philip, they were being baptized. Verse 12. But then it very, very specifically says, but they did not receive the Holy Spirit. And so Peter and uh, John came. Uh, when the apostles in Jerusalem, verse 14, heard Samaria receive the word, they sent Peter and John. They came and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not fallen on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they began laying their hands on them and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. And this is probably the most important passage. I can't write and talk. Because Simon saw that the Holy Spirit was conferred or given when the apostles laid hands on these people. He says, I want that. How much money? <laughs> Peter says, huh? No, you're not buying it. And by the way, it doesn't belong to you. And your mag magical arts and going around and amassing a crowd and, and showing off what you can do is not the way this works. So, you know, you're full of bitterness and you need to repent. But we're told in this passage that the Samaritans received the Holy Spirit when the apostles came and laid hands on them. And if you don't understand that, it goes on to say that's how it happened. Now, when we get to Cornelius in chapter 10, 
that may be true, but it isn't what happened. In the quickest way possible, because we're going to study this passage more at length next week. Actually, the next two weeks, we'll look at it uh, two more times. But Peter's preaching, and in the middle of his sermon, with no warning or any mention of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit falls on Cornelius and the people there, and they begin to speak in tongues. And Peter says, uh, the last time I saw that happen, it was me and us. And the Holy Spirit fell, and we began to speak in tongues. And by the way, uh, I think in chapter 10 it says that people were hearing them glorify God, not gibberish. These are words, but not words that Romans in, in Caesarea know. The language was coming from another place, from the Spirit. There's no laying on of hands there. When we get to Acts 19, Apollos uh, powerfully preaches John's baptism, and he leaves town, and Paul comes into Ephesus. I don't know why he asked the question, but he walked in and he said, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, we don't know what Holy Spirit means. We, we never heard if there is a Holy Spirit. One of my commentaries specifically said they knew about the Holy Spirit because they knew John's baptism. Read the text. That's not what it says. It says they did not know. So just because you know about John's baptism doesn't mean you know everything everyone else knows about it. And we're explained. No, they didn't know that. Paul said, well then in what were you baptized? Oh, slam dunk. Must be baptism that does it. Unless you keep reading. Because what happened that day is Paul told them to be baptized, they were baptized, and then he laid hands on them, and then they received the Holy Spirit. Now, my way of dealing with this has always been the Samaritans spoke in tongues, the Gentiles received the Spirit as on us at the beginning, so God did it with the Jews in Acts 2, with the Samaritans in Acts 8, and the Gentiles in Acts 10, but I forgot Acts 19. Just some people in Ephesus. What great new people group are we talking about now that this is going to? That kind of shoots my theory that that's only the beginning of each set of people that receive the Spirit. Here's where I am, and this is way too fast. Where I am is God will do it when He wants and where He wants. We know that obedience, He, he gives it to, the, to those who obey Him. He gives it to those who ask Him. He gives it because he just wants to. You know, I don't know why we want to orchestrate this and script it out so that I can look at you and say, okay, here's what's going to happen. This is going to happen, then this is going to happen, then you're going to do this, and then, this, and then you're going to receive the Holy Spirit. One, two, three. God will not be reduced to one, two, three. God says, this is what I want from you. This is what we have to do. And all of that is very collective. And that's what we'll really, really see in more detail in the next two weeks. I apologize for going so fast through that. But I, I, I just, I think it's not as nailed down as the commentaries I read, the preachers I've heard, or even the way I've preached it in the past. So you look at it and see what you think. And we'll, uh, we, can, we can discuss it some as we're talking about baptism next week as well. Thanks. We have scouts likely coming in if you'll help them find a spot and uh, scout families joining us today.